My name is Dana Goldman. I'm the director of USC's Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Public-Private Efforts to Test and Mitigate COVID-19. Uh, as you saw in the invitation, we have a pretty distinguished panel, so I'm going to get to this pretty quickly. They'll each talk for five to ten minutes, and then we'll have a discussion followed by Q&A, and you can submit your questions uh, as we go. I, I'm going to introduce each of them right before their session. Our first a guest is Dr. Bob Kocher. Bob is a non-resident senior fellow at the Schaefer Center. He's also a member of the California COVID-19 Testing Task Force and has been supporting California's response to COVID-19 for the past two months and really dedicated in that regard. Uh, prior to taking on that role, he co-founded several healthcare services companies and he also designed uh, the Affordable Care Act as part of the Obama administration. Uh, Bob, please take it away. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this discussion. I'm looking forward to our comments very much. I'll give you a few thoughts on how I'm thinking about COVID-19 and our response uh, to maybe frame what we talk about. So first, greetings from Sacramento, uh, where I spent much of the last uh, two months. Initially, we arrived and worked on the epidemiological modeling. Then I helped on what was the stay-at-home order and what are the interventions that we've taken. And for the last six weeks, I've been helping to lead the efforts to scale testing in California. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, get this up bigger. Um, um, when we first arrived, we began looking at um, kind of the epidemiological data to try to figure out what will happen. And when you first run the math um, with an R naught of 2.4, what you see is apocalypse, which is this curve. And that's what leads every state and every country to take actions. And what you end up with is now what we're seeing, which is a flattening of the curve here and a tremendous amount of energy around the discussion of what do we do now and how might you modify the stay-at-home orders to allow the economy to be more vibrant, but avoid what could be a horrible second wave. The thing that you have to remember is that a virus exists to spread itself, and a virus has an R naught in this case of about 2.4. And so we are thinking a lot about how do you avoid that second wave, and how do you minimize contacts per day such that we can make this curve remain flat for long enough that hopefully we can find therapeutics for a vaccine. Um, what we have seen in Italy and in California is that these social distancing, physical distancing interventions have worked quite well. Uh, in California, we're at about 40,000 cases of COVID-19. Uh, we thought we'd be around 400,000 cases at this point in time if we hadn't taken these steps. Uh, and right now, the r naught in most of California is somewhere between 1 and 1.3, which is dramatically better and much more like the flu uh, than COVID-19 in its natural state. What we're working on now is ramping up testing. The mainstay of testing for COVID-19 is PCR-based testing. Uh, this test is one that can pick up the virus right after you catch it, uh, and for the first 14 or, 14 or so days after an infection is positive, and it helps us know when someone is spreading a virus. This is the type of test that you would want to use if a patient had a fever or for a worker in a high-risk occupation to make sure that they are safe to work and not make others sick. The second type of test is a blood test called serology. There's a lot of talk about serology tests. Serology tests can tell you if a patient's been exposed to the virus in the past and has antibodies. Antibodies may be protected, but we're not sure. Um, and serology tests are tricky because we've all probably had some corona-related virus in our life, and so cross-reactivity is a big issue. Um, our team in California has tested about 30 different serology tests that are available around the world, and most of them are not very sensitive or specific. And so um, the mainstay of testing should be PCR. Serology tests will give us a sense of in the population who's been exposed and what the prevalence has been, and, and, and potentially who may be at lower risk based upon the protectiveness of the antibodies. One thing to note is that humans have protection from different infections for different amounts of time. What we don't know in the case of COVID-19 is does that protection look like measles and rubella that once you've been exposed to either a vaccine or the disease, you'll probably never get it again, or is it more like diphtheria, tetanus, or the flu 
where actually you need to get, get boosters and be refreshed very, very often. This is really important because if this protection doesn't last very long, we're gonna to have to take very different actions to manage COVID-19 than if we get good protection. Today, California and most states are in the process of ramping up um, the most ambitious contact tracing efforts um, ever undertaken in America uh, to try to combat this disease. Um, California is currently repurposing 10,000 state employees to become a call center full of people who will track down contacts from people who have positive infections. Uh, this is the rate limiting step to reopen the economy and it requires both testing so we can ubiquitously get testing to people who've been exposed to get them back to work and out of their homes because we're going to tell you if you're exposed go home and stay there until you get a test that says you can go back out again uh, and we have to do a very good job at figuring out all the people that you may have exposed uh, and so there's a bunch of efforts to think about is there technological solutions that can help whether it's a cell phone app that can tell us all the phones you've been nearby or at least tell us the places that you've been um, or other tools to help that person when they call you and ask you tell me every place that you've been for the last four days uh, to make that list a lot more accurate. Um, I'm very hopeful um, that we'll be able to suppress the disease enough that you can do contact tracing. The rate limiting step is to not have that many people infected each day, so you have a shot at actually reaching out to enough of them to contain this. If you can contain it, you can really flatten the curve, and we've seen that happen in South Korea, uh, where they're actually able to fully contain outbreaks right now and control things. Vaccines are what we are all banking on. Uh, vaccines take a long time to make, and while it's true that this morning uh, we heard that the Oxford group has begun some human testing, uh, I would also say that coronavirus has been a really challenging uh, virus to make vaccines to. We've not yet succeeded on the earth at doing this, whether it's SARS or MERS. Uh, we have never seen more people working on this problem, and I pray uh, that we get a vaccine. The other question with the vaccine is safety. It will be very hard to do the type of safety studies that you would like to do normally um, to ensure a vaccine is safe. And so there's a lot of uncertainty today, and I think a fair amount of time between us and a vaccine. Um, with that, I want to, um, I've given you a lot. Um, I will pause, thank you, and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Bob. Um, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Stephen Galson. Dr. Galson is the Senior Vice President for Global Regulatory Affairs and Safety at Amgen and he's the leader of the company's crisis response team for COVID-19. Uh, prior to that, Dr. Galson spent more than 20 years in government service as an epidemiologic investigator at the CDC, chief medical officer of the U.S. Department of Ener Energy and the EPA, and at the end of this period as director of the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and the acting Surgeon General. During his stint as acting Surgeon General, he was involved in government activities in response to H1N1 in 2009. Thank you very much, Dana, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be with you all today. The first thing I wanna talk about is, you know, what the company has done. Uh, you can imagine a company of 23,000 people at Amgen uh, in 100 countries around the world. Uh, the, this has been a big shock uh, and required a lot of adjustment. And we've tried to communicate throughout this period that our very, very top priority is supporting our staff and their families. And the decisions that we've had to make along the way haven't been that hard when we think about that as our top priority. Next, of course, we're responsible to the patients all around the world that are getting our products. So we've had a couple thousand people that have had to go into work. They never left going to work, manufacturing and distributing our products around the world. And that's, again, been a pretty easy touch point to enable us to make decisions about uh, what to do next. We've also, of course, supported the communities that we're in in a philanthropic way, and uh, that's been very satisfying for those of us involved with it as well. And then, of course, we're using our scientific expertise to try to address the problem. And we have several different categories of activities that I'm going to go up through at a fairly high level. The first, and I'll, I'll um, first touch on genetic studies that we're doing. Uh, 
we, we have a company in Iceland called Decode, uh, and they recently published a paper in the New England Journal about a very early study about the genetics of the COVID virus. They have unique capacity to sequence genomes. And I wanna quickly go through uh, what this study found because uh, it's, it's really extremely interesting and they're continuing to do this work. Um, it really gives an idea to health authorities about what happens when the virus enters a closed place like the island of Iceland that then cut off travel so new infections were, were reduced and they were able to track by repetitively sampling a group of people in Iceland how the infection spread. So this is really a unique globally uh, opportunity to study the virus. And that's what the publication was about. They found the following things. You've already heard about the gender difference. Uh, so they found that the sampled women, and these were, these were um, you know, a population that was not sick, just a random sample um, collected in several different ways in Iceland. Women are less likely to, than men to test positive and children under 10 were, were lower risk. So this isn't about how they do when they get in the hospital. This is just about whether this sample had more infections than women and children. And, and it, it's, it's very, very interesting. We don't exactly know why women are less likely to be infected and same thing with children, but that's what we found. 43% of the positive tests had no symptoms. Other groups have looked at this. It's extremely important to understand when we look about moving forward, the fact that so many people have the infection and presumably can spread it, uh, although we don't have great data on that without actually having symptoms. Um, we've, we were able through our unique types of genetic analysis to see that the strains came into the country from at least nine different, came into Iceland from at least nine different countries. And we found um, 409 mutations, including 291 that had not been detected previously. Now, a note on that is uh, we don't know whether these mutations are all meaningful, only a geneticist really appreciates this. So the fact that the virus mutates frequently is important, but it's not necessarily bad news or good news. So that's, that's important to keep in mind. We are also looking at current therapies um, to detect whether they're gonna be helpful. And this, this slide has a lot on it, and I'm not gonna go through all of the details, but first, up in this, the top left-hand corner are the monoclonal antibodies. So that is looking at antibodies specific to the virus to see whether they can be developed. And I have a couple more points on that later. Uh, presumably, those kinds of antibodies could be injected into people uh, and stop the infection before it gets out of control. There are also drugs that are targeting proteases that are involved in the replication of the virus in the body. And that's the antiviral drug that you've heard so much about remdesivir. They will stop the uh, replication of the virus. They're also, in, um, in the far right side of the slide, drugs that are being tested as anti-inflammatory drugs. The hope with these drugs is that um, when patients are in the hospital and getting sicker and sicker, they'll interrupt the process and result in people not getting as severely um, ill. There's more on this slide about hydroxychloroquine, which um, I'm not gonna go into because it doesn't look like it is very effective based on what we know today. We also have a new partnership with a company called Adaptive Technologies. This company is a specialist in what I mentioned before, developing neutralizing antibodies. So we're working very closely with them to try to identify based on work using serum from patients that have recovered, which antibodies can be used to specifically target uh, COVID-19. And then Amgen, 
we're an expert at manufacturing and uh, doing the immunology around these kind of therapies. If we find them, we can hopefully manufacture them as a therapeutic once they're carefully tested. We are also working with partners around the world to establish clinical trial platforms. There are a number of these. One is at the National Institutes of Health, which is called ACTIVE, and that is the idea of instead of all of these companies and government agencies duplicating efforts to try to get together and parse out the work to individual groups, hopefully we'll get to the finish line faster. We're also working with an industry partnership called Transcelerate Biopharma about sharing data. So as we get to de develop uh, these products and the data is coming in, sharing it again to improve the efficiency and the speed of the process. There's another partnership called COVID R&D, which is between um, companies to try to design some trials that we could do together. Actually, uh, groups of companies testing multiple therapies together to reduce the time that it takes, improve the efficiency, and also for the physicians that are at the end of taking care of patients, so they don't have to deal with a thousand different entities that are trying to test different therapies. So I wanna move as my last point very quickly to how Amgen as a major company in Southern California is thinking about how to get our staff back to the office. And I know that's a top subject that people are very interested in. The overarching message is that we're not gonna do anything to get our staff back to the office that's gonna interfere with staff safety. And like I said at the beginning, when you think about that, it's a lot easier to make the subsequent decisions. Of course, we can't all go back to the office at once. This is gonna be with us a long time. And in the end, uh, we're not gonna be able to go back to an office environment where we can't appropriately social distance until we've got a vaccine or immunity in the population. We also are facing among our staff of a full range of views about risk tolerance. Um, some people want to get perhaps away from their spouses and children and get back to the office no matter what. Other people don't want to subject themselves to any other people who could possibly be a risk. So trying to find a path forward for the company that is uh, appealing to all of our staff is very important. One of the things we really do feel like we need is on-site on testing. And so we're working closely at, with that, and then we're working on different ways to screen patients, like temperature screening, and what our policies should be about masks. So with that, thank you very much and look forward to questions. Thank you, and I think that's a perfect segue into uh, Professor Lakdawalla. Uh, Darius Lakdawalla is the Director of Research at the Schaefer Center. He's the Quintiles Chair in the School of Pharmacy and the Saul Price School of Public Policy. He spent over a decade working on novel approaches to quantifying the value and cost effectiveness of medical technology. And most recently, he's turned his attention to how we can, uh, how we can find cost effective strategies for the large scale diagnosis of COVID-19 among workers and students. Darius? Thanks, Dana, and, and thank you very much. Those were two uh, fantastic presentations. And I want to um, uh, take my lead from uh, several points that Bob and Steve made about the importance of widespread testing. Bob made the point that uh, that's going to be the backbone of this huge, maybe unprecedented contact tracing effort that we're going to have to stand up. And uh, Steve made the point that a lot of infection potentially is being transmitted by asymptomatic people. So testing as a strategy for surveillance uh, is critical for us to manage these problems. So I, I wanna just talk briefly about a research project we're working on uh, at the Schaefer Center, uh, which is how to test at really a, a massive scales um, in a cost effective manner. Because some researchers are arguing that the US alone is going to need to field tens of millions of tests per day potentially. 
um, which no matter how cheap tests become, that's gonna end up being a lot of money. So the question is, how can this be done as cost effectively as possible? Um, we actually are studying something called pooled testing for COVID-19. This is, um, it's, it's an idea that's been used uh, in the context of COVID-19 already. Um, there have been an, uh, several Israeli labs that have studied it. Um, Stanford used it in the early days of, of monitoring and surveillance um, of COVID-19. The idea, though, dates back to World War II when the U.S. Army developed it as a strategy for screening draftees for syphilis at, um, uh, at, at a very cost-effective way. The idea is pretty straightforward. Imagine that you have 100 people that you want to screen, and let's say there are only like, five people uh, who are currently actively infected out of that 100. You could go ahead and field 100 tests, but that can get costly in a hurry if you're testing a huge population. What if instead you split this population up into, let's say, um, 20 groups of five patients each, and you pooled the samples uh, within those 20 groups into one um, sample that gets tested, and you figure out which of those pools has someone who's positive. So if you think about the math, the math behind this, we have five people who are sick. So at most, we're going to get five pools back that test positive. And then you go ahead and test everybody in those five remaining pools individually to see who actually has the illness. The bottom line is that for these 100 people, instead of running 100 tests, you can end up screening everyone with more like 45 or 50 tests. And so decreasing the cost of testing by a half or potentially even more um, can make a major contribution to uh, the feasibility of widespread testing strategies. There are a number of uh, issues that need to be resolved though with pool testing. One of them is how do you test this? How do you figure out the right size of the pools? Because if you make your pool too big, then everybody, every pool is gonna test positive because it'll have someone in there who's sick. And if you make the pools too small, then you're not harvesting all of the cost effectiveness gains from pool testing in the first place. So one thing we've been doing is thinking about what's the optimal pool size. Um, and I'll show you some of the uh, findings of our research in that respect. So think about a population that has some underlying active infection rate of COVID. Um, and you can see one thing that's clear from this figure, which shows you the optimal size of a testing pool as a function of the active infection rate. When you're dealing with populations that maybe are, uh, that face lower um, illness prevalence, uh, maybe in areas of the country that are less hard hit, you can afford to have bigger pools. And that, that kind of makes sense because when you don't have very many sick patients, then even with really big pools, you're gonna get a lot of pools testing negative. So if the active infection rate is well below 1%, for instance, you can have pools of up to 30 people each um, where you're pooling samples from a lot of people. If on the other hand, you look over at active infection rates, sort of where we think we are in the, in the three, four, five, six, seven, eight percent range, four, five, and six person pools make a lot of sense. Um, and this has a significant effect on the cost of uh, testing. So let's, think, let's look at the cost savings per worker from a pool testing strategy compared to testing everybody individually. If you knew how to set the optimal pool size, and I'll come to that in a minute, but suppose you know the, roughly the prevalence of the infection in your population and you set the pool size perfectly then for infection rates around two, four, 6%, which is kind of in the ballpark of where most American cities find themselves in terms of active infection rates, maybe even lower, you can achieve cost savings of two thirds or more over individualized testing. But now you might be wondering, how the heck am I gonna figure out the optimal pool size if I'm an employer? I don't know how many people are sick. And certainly at this stage when we're not, when we haven't fielded many tests, the good news is that simple rules of thumb perform really well too. So if you just look at, for instance, a pool size of four, let's just pick that number. Four is a good number here because it gets you really close to the optimal for the vast majority um, of cases. And you only lose a little bit uh, when the infection is really rare. But when the infection's rare, you're saving so much money from pool testing anyway that losing a little bit is not such a big deal. Now, there's also a cautionary tale about rules of thumb, which is that 
if you swing for the fences and think to yourself, wow, I probably don't have very much COVID-19, I'm gonna have really big pools. That might work okay if you're right, but you can see if I set the pool size at 11 and I'm wrong about my prevalence and my prevalence is actually significantly higher, I can eat away at a lot of the cost savings. And in fact, at some point, if, if the prevalence gets too high, it's actually worse to do pool testing than it is to do individual testing because you end up having so many pools testing positive that there's basically no gain in the number of tests that you run. Now, one, one um, unique issue with COVID that was not the case in syphilis, by the way, when the US Army developed this in the first place, is that our COVID tests are not nearly as reliable as syphilis tests are. Syphilis tests have extraordinarily high sensitivity and specificity. So one question we asked or we're asking in this research is, what's the impact of imperfectly reliable tests on pooling strategies? So we, we thought about a test that let's say um, has a 30% false negative rate because in fact, PCR tests have been shown at least so far to have very high false negative rates. Hopefully that'll come down over time, but let's take a relatively bad scenario and think about the implications. So couple things uh, to note here. One is one solution to imperfect tests is that you can afford to do an additional round of follow-up testing on the pools because you're saving a considerable amount of money by reducing the number of tests. So what we're modeling here is, imagine that you take two independent samples for the pooling round and you test them both. Um, and you, you figure out who test po which pools test positive one out of those two times. So there's this confirmatory round to deal with the unreliability of the test. So the first thing that happens is the pool sizes should go up because basically what's happening is um, it's costly to have more pools when you're running multiple tests on each pool. So one way of mitigating that issue is you, you can have larger pools. And if the tests are more reliable, it's a little more comfortable, comfortable to have a larger pool because you're more confident in the tests. But the big question is, now if we're going through this process, this painstaking process of having follow-up testing and all this, do we still save money with pool testing given that the COVID test is not 100% reliable? And the answer is you do save, in fact, about two thirds as much with um, even a relatively imperfect test that if you just add one round of confirmatory testing, let's take a rule of thumb here of a pool size of seven. What this shows you is that for infection rates at 5% or under, you're saving uh, about half uh, over individualized testing. And in fact, uh, for most active infection rates that are plausible over the near term, you're saving at least a third and maybe more. Um, so we think that pool testing, which has been used to some extent already in monitoring COVID, might be uh, one component in um, a strategy for national testing, contact tracing, um, and reopening workplaces and universities. So I'll stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Darius. So I think we're going to have a lot of questions. Feel free to submit them through the Q&A, but I'll start with Bob. Um, you know, traditionally, the U.S. healthcare system is accused of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Uh, in this case, we're in a situation where we're undertreating and underdiagnosis. Medicare is paying hundred dollars per test. Is that too little, too much, or how do we get out of this equilibrium? It shows you that it's something even stronger than capitalism that's getting in the way because <laughs> the PCR test kits cost about twenty dollars, and so. Is, this is a very high margin activity for a lab to do. And the labs in California that I'm working with are calling me every day saying, where are my samples? Um, I think actually it's been more of a demand side problem now, which is it's very hard to get your sample collected because there's not many locations to go get a swab done. We've had giant shortages on the earth of these incredibly um, hard to get flock swabs from Copan made in Lombardy, Italy, which is the one that you're supposed to use. Uh, and so we run into a supply chain bottlenecks of the whole world's trying to buy the same thing at the same time. And there's patents that get in the way of making identical copies and um, real scarcity. And so we in California have done a lot of work to find new manufacturers for things that are very similar to the Fox swab. We've now bought 10 million of them and just sent out a couple hundred thousand last week. Um, and now we're expanding sample collection facilities with 86 new facilities opening up 
over the next two weeks to make it easier to get tested. And then today, we'll be broadening the guidelines for who's eligible for testing to make it easier to get a sample actually collected. You probably were turned away two or three weeks ago from getting a test done if you were not a high risk individual, no matter how high your fever was. Uh, and so now we need to actually allow the market to work, which is pay enough to make the labs want to do this and have enough supplies in the world that you can actually have the market work and get people to get their swaps done. Um, I think that we are seeing um, a challenge that our health system has been run so efficiently for so many years that they, we, we don't have any excess capacity in the manufacturing of supplies, of these commodity type supplies for health systems. We don't have any sort of um, forward deploy warehouses of emergency materials or PPE. Uh, and so we at the state have done a lot of work to build that system kind of in real time, but it takes several weeks to get that scaled up and those weeks were costly. Thank you. Um, Steve, uh, one of the things both you and Bob talked about were vaccines and obviously people are fascinated with the notion that we might be able to develop one as, uh, as Oxford is suggesting in September. Um, but other estimates suggest it could be three to five years. Could you talk a little bit about your own view of uh, our ability to get a vaccine here? Sure, and it, my, my view is informed by my work as a, as a regulator at FDA and then as a drug developer at, um, at Amgen, even though we're not working specifically on vaccines. Um, drug and vaccine development, as much as I hate to admit it, are somewhat governed by serendipity and luck. Um, and so if everything goes swimmingly well and there are no adverse events when it's tested in, in uh, larger groups of people, then uh, we could get a vaccine are available perhaps by the end of the year. Um, I don't see how it could happen by September in terms of availability, uh, even if everything went well. But what we do know is that in drug development, things never all go well. They, they, you, they're usually bumps in the road, whether it's in the early phases of development, actually the cellular work that's involved in figuring out what the right vaccine is, or in phases of testing, or adverse events that you completely didn't expect coming out. And so it's, you know, when you heard Dr. Fauci at the beginning of this saying 12 to 18 months, I thought that sounded like a reasonable time. Could it be faster? Yes. Could it be slower? Yes. I'm hopeful though, that with so many very, very skilled groups working on the same problem at the same time, it'll be on the shorter rather than the long end, but it's impossible to predict accurately. That's too bad. <laughs> uh, so Darius, we're getting a lot of questions about the test and I'd like to ask you too, um, what, what are the mechanics of a pooled test? Uh, does everyone spit into the same bucket and then you <laughs> hand it to the, that was not my joke, that was Bill Martyr's <laughs> joke, by the way. Uh, and then also, could you talk about lowering of sensitivity? And you might want to put a plug in for the forthcoming white paper when you do that. Okay, yeah. So thank you um, for those questions. So mechanically, so first of all, I should note that I am an economist. I'm not a real doctor. So everything <laughs> I say should be cross-checked by somebody who knows what they're, what they're talking about here. Uh, but the, the, the answer is no, you don't all spit into the same cup. There is a uh, kind of sample collection problem where you still have to collect samples at the individual level. Um, and then those are then combined um, into a single uh, sample, which is then tested uh, via PCR, for instance, in the case of figuring out if people are infected. So mechanically, there is still the problem of collection. Um, and so we've got to figure out uh, efficiencies in how these things are collected. As you know, Dana, there's been some discussion of, of um, uh, saliva tests um, emerging, and that could be a cheap and convenient way of uh, collecting samples. And if we can reduce the cost of collection, that is one bottleneck. That's an, a separate bottleneck that I think needs to be addressed. I'm sorry, the second question was about uh, about testing Reduce errors. Reduce sensitivity, but I think you can just refer to the white paper for that. 
Yeah, so we, we do have a white paper coming out on this question of, of sensitivity. And the, so the, the issue is that when you pool tests together, if you think there are errors that are happening at the lab on a pooled sample, then that error is much more consequential than if it happens on an individual sample. Um, so we, we have we've analyzed how confirmatory tests or follow-up tests of pool samples can help. The other point that is worth noting is that not all errors are of that sort, of, of a lab making an error with a sample. A lot of errors, in fact, have been on the collection side, that a swab isn't done properly, et cetera, et cetera. And that actually is, is improved by pooled testing, because basically, if you think about it, uh, I might have a bad collection done, but there's still a chance someone else in my pool is positive and has a good collection done. So it's sort of like a form of insurance for me against a bad collection process. So some testing errors actually get improved with pooled testing and some don't. And there's, so there's a need for some confirmatory testing to deal with that. It's, thank you. It's also very clear to me that we didn't allot enough time for this session, so. Uh, we're coming up on the time, but um, David Beyer asks, uh, and I will address this to Bob, how are we going to get to scale both in the United States and California on contact tracing using human personnel? Are we going to use students, AmeriCorps, National Guard, the unemployed? David's got a million ideas about how to do this, but we'll let you talk. And the retired. Um, we should use them too. Uh, we're using 10,000 state employees right now. Uh, and uh, call centers the state has, and, um, and we'll hopefully be using some technology soon to help that. Um, I think the plan is to then shift from the 10,000 state volunteers, uh, employees, to hiring people to do this, and that will be a combination of people who have lost their jobs, unfortunately. Um, I hope every medical student does this, and a bunch of other people who have good social skills um, who can do this. I think we need to augment that for sure. Uh, with technology. The Apple Google works really exciting around how at least it can give us a list of how many people we need to try to figure out that you've been with and where they were and how long you were together. Uh, so that could be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, that answered several questions. So, um, sorry, I went on mute. Steve, um, could you talk a little bit about how frequently you think we're going to have to need, we're going to need to test people in the workplace? Will it vary by people? Um, and um, also the problems with false negatives? Sure. Well, absolutely a challenge, and we haven't determined final testing policies yet, but these are going to be driven by the frequency or the, the presence of community transmission in different places where we have staff. So obviously you have to do more testing if the virus is around more. And when we have remote locations like in Iceland that is working on eradication, uh, then you will have to test less. Uh, how frequently is not clear. And I don't think we really have a solution yet to this problem of asymptomatic um, uh, transmission that may be occurring. Uh, FDA just had a, co a conference call on testing today where they reminded the listeners that the virus PCR testing are not approved for testing asymptomatic people. And there's going to have to be more studies to really understand the specificity and sensitivity of those PCR tests for people that don't have symptoms. So no easy answer. No, that's a, that means it's going to take time. Uh, a question I'm going to direct towards Bob, which is, comes from David Squires. What's known, what is the role that primary care practices are going to play in prevention and mitigation among their patients and staff? Um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Good question. Um, I, don't, I can't say I have a really thought through answer. Um, I would observe that we're seeing unprecedented adoption of telemedicine. And that makes me very happy because that's a way to help patients who um, avoid going to medical settings and avoid people having to put on PPE to see them. And a lot of healthcare can be solved that way. And I'm involved with one telemedicine company called Doctor in Demand. And we've seen a, you know, a many X fold um, increase in demand. Uh, and that's true for all the different telemedicine companies. And many, many practices have adopted telemedicine offerings for their patients as well as ways to text their doctors and 
Um, I think we're seeing a lot of healthcare done well in that, in that manner, and I think that will probably persist for quite a while. We're beginning to see specialty care also being done virtually. Uh, and one of the cool things about that is that you can do primary care doctors with a specialist at the same time with a patient and much better coordinate plans. So that could be a better way to do care, which I'm excited about. Uh, I think primary doctors will probably also have a very important role in screening of their patients and determining for a patient based upon their healthcare risk factors, the optimal approach to screening. And while employers will have sort of a employer-based approach, uh, I think primary care doctors will have a much more nuanced view for an individual for what's the, what makes sense. Uh, for you. Okay, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna finish up and I wanna ask each of you for one research question that would inform public policy right now that you would like to see answered almost immediately to help answer this question. And so does anyone wanna start because they know? I don't, okay, Bob, thank you. Um, we'll go Bob, Steve, and then Darius. I badly want to understand what we know about immunity and protection for those who've been exposed and how long that lasts. Excellent, thank you. Steve? I want to know if asymptomatic infected people are infectious and how infectious they are, whether they're less infectious than symptomatic infectious people, if symptomatic positive people. Excellent. Darius? Yeah, I, I, well, it's related to that. I want to know how many asymptomatic infected people there are. So I think take it together, we'll get a pretty good sweep of everything we need to know. Great. Well, I want to thank you all. I want to thank our audience for uh, participating. We really appreciate that. And we've had three uh, brilliant experts. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time and everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you.